Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to do Newton's theory of gravity. We already talked about it already. Uh, I mentioned it several chapters ago. Uh, but today we're going to talk about Kepler's laws and then how they are consequences of Newton's law of gravity. And then we will define also the potential energy, the gravitational potential energy uh, far away from the surface of the Earth. And then uh, we'll talk about satellites and uh, uh, and so on. Okay, so Kepler's laws. So Kepler's laws, uh, the book goes into some historical aspects of the of the discovery of Newton's law of gravitation. Um, I won't go through those. You can read about it in the book. It's about a page or two. Um, so let's just read Kepler's laws. So Kepler became came before Newton and looked at ma uh, many of the astronomical data and came up with these three laws that kind of summarized uh, all the all the data that he observed so it says or he said that planets move in elliptical orbits with the sun at one focus of an of the ellipse so they move in elliptical orbits and the sun happens to be at one focus of the ellipse so and then it says a line drawn between the sun and a planet sweeps equal areas during equal intervals in time and then the square of a planet's orbital uh, period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis length so let's draw let's start with the first one that says planets move in elliptical orbits around the sun so remember a circle is kind of a special kind of, a, of an ellipse and to draw an ellipse you you can take um, let me just like you. you can take a string pin it here so you have the string it's loose and then tighten it so you tighten the string and then uh, move around and then that will draw uh, draw an ellipse so let me just draw uh, an ellipse for you it looks like something like this this is the ellipse it has one fo two focus two foci one of them is here and the other one is here so let me just draw this one where the sun is so it says the sun is here okay and um, the planet is here the, the planet that's orbiting is here let me draw it with a different one different color so let's say the planet is going something like this okay and uh, so that's the uh, ellipse part then it says here a line drawn between the sun and the planet sweeps equal areas in equal intervals of time so let me uh, let me draw the planet maybe let's say when it was here and then it came here after let's say uh, this is let's say it's earth it's going around the sun 365 days so let's say in a few days let's say in a week it went this much so a line equal areas so a line drawn between the sun and the planet so here is the sun here is the planet they draw a line so as that line goes as the planet changes it sweeps this area here so that's the area here within let's say let's say in one day it swept that much area when the planet was this far away it says it sweeps equal areas in equal times so let's say the planet six months later or so let's say it's here I draw a line here and then uh, in a day it this area has to equal to the area here so it can't be just this much because this area will not match this one so it has to be a little large it has to move here to make this area larger which implies that the speed of the planet when it's closer to the Sun will be larger than the speed of the planet when it's farther away because it it moves over a longer uh, arc here it has to move faster to make the area swept uh, more okay and then it says here the square of the planet's orbital period is proportional to the cube of the semi uh, of the semi major axis so our book takes the attitude of it says let's just take uh, a, a circular orbits and the and these uh, the ellipses here are fairly circular they, they are very close to us to be in a circle but here is the semi-major axis this longer axis here the center this is the semi 
major, uh, major, semi major, and this here will be the semi minor axis. It says the period, the square of the period is proportional to the cube of, uh, of the semi major axis. So let's say, take the special case where the orbital or the, is, a, is, a, is a circle. So let's say the sun will be here and this planet will go around the sun in a circle, right? A circle means this focus and this focus, they come close, they just become one point, it becomes a circle. So if it's a circle here, excuse me, if it's a circle, then uh, the radius is the same. And uh, so since the radius is the same, um, and the planet is going this way, the speed will be constant. We'll see why in a moment. Um, and so it's clear, I think, that in this case, equal areas in equal times, because the speed here, the speed here, the speed here, everywhere is the same. So uh, equal areas in equal, uh, in equal times. And so now, but this does not tell us how motion happens and why it happens, because we have Newton's laws that tell us why motion happens. Namely, the second law, it says F equal to ma, the net force equal to the mass. The net force on the object will equal to the mass of the object times its own acceleration. If we take the special case, elliptical orbits will be more difficult than this. They would require us to do a little more math. So we're going to take circular orbits. So if it's a circular orbit, um, and the planet is moving. So I'm going to call the mass of the sun here capital M and the mass of whatever is orbiting the sun as little m. There is a force that's causing it to go around this circular motion. And the question is, what is that force? And Newton answered that question. He said that this force is a force that points toward the center. And uh, the magnitude of that force is has this value g the mass of the first uh, of this mass and then the mass of the second mass divided by the separation between the two masses squared that's the left hand side so newton gave us this remember when we do f equal to ma we have to figure what the forces are right you have to figure what the forces are maybe it's the force of the strain it's the normal force it's the tension force it's the spring force, it's, you know, any number of forces, friction, so on. In here, Newton gave us that force, told us what this force is. It says any two masses, any two point masses, if you have a mass here, M1, and a mass here, M2, and they are separated by a distance R, then there is a force between them. The force is always attractive. This mass will try to attract this mass and pull it towards it towards itself, and by Newton's third law, this mass will also try to pull on this mass and pull it by, uh, towards itself. And so, um, you got this, uh, uh, this formula here. And it says it's proportional to the product of the two masses divided by the distance between them squared, and then there is this proportionality constant here called g, the gravitational constant. And this g here, uh, is not the little g, which is 9.8, which is near the surface of the Earth. That is just a special case. It comes out from this. We'll see in a moment. So if you have g here, it's 6.67 uh, times 10 to the minus 11. And the, the units should be newtons, meters squared, divided by kilograms to the power 2. To the power two. Okay. And it also... This applies to point masses, right? If you have a little mass here and a little mass here, that's the force between them. How about planets? I mean, planets are not point masses. You've got this planet here, and maybe this one here, and they're separated by a distance r from their centers. So how do we deal with this? Well, um, uh, it will... It's, a, it's actually a difficult problem to figure because you got the planet looks like that, it's a sphere. So you have to divide it into little masses. So you divide this into little masses and then find the force of this little mass on a little mass here 
and then find the force of this little mass on a little mass here, and then divide this then into many, many little masses, and then find the force of this little mass on all of these little masses, and then redo the problem to figure the force of the next little mass on all of these little masses, sum them up, and then at the end, it can be shown there is the easy, there is the harder way, and then there is the easier way by Gauss's law or the divergence theorem. But uh, you can show that the force between them is simply, if they are symmetric and spherical and so on, that uh, the force between them is just the pro just like as if they were point masses with all the mass focused at the center here. So the separation is between the two centers, and uh, it acts as if the whole the whole mass is at the center here, at the center, at the center of mass. So the problem is vastly uh, much easier, and uh, this way it, it simplifies a lot. And I think that's why Newton, when he discovered this law, he held on before publishing it, because it applies for point masses. But he knew that it has to be. Uh, for the, the force between two planets, it, it has to act as if the entire mass is here and the entire mass for this one is here, but he had to prove it. So it took him a while to prove that. Okay? Um, all right, so that is that. So for example, uh, let, us, let us see. Um, let's say uh, here is Earth. Uh, here is Earth, here is the surface of the Earth, right? And then somebody is standing here, somebody is standing here. So this is, this is M1, this is the mass of the Earth, this is M2. How far are they apart? Well, they are this far. Uh, remember, we said from center to center. This is little m, and this is capital M. The bigger one is the mass of the Earth, and this one is little m, the mass of the person who is standing on the surface of the earth, or whatever object is standing there. So Newton's law of gravitation says the force between them would be F equal to G capital M divided by, uh, times little m divided by the separation between them squared. And the second law says F equals to ma, so it's the little mass times a. So I, I'm interested in the acceleration of this mass, what it should be. So the acceleration, so you can divide both sides by little m, so the acceleration will equal to capital G, capital M, divided by R squared. Capital G is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. Capital M, if, we're, if this is the Earth, then it will be, um, I think it's 5.98 uh, times 10 to the 24 kilograms, but I have to confirm this in a moment. Divided by the radius of the Earth, which is 6,400 kilometers, or 6.4 uh, times 10 to the 6 meters, and you have to square this. I think the mean radius of the Earth is 6.38 times 10 to the, uh, to the 6. But let's see what, what we get here, roughly speaking. And uh, you should actually guess, what should be the acceleration of a mass near the surface of the Earth? It should be 9.8. So this thing should give us 9.8 if, if my numbers here are correct. Uh, I'm relying on memory here. So I have 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, and then times 5.98 times 10 to the 20, uh, 10 to the 24th power, and then we need to divide by. Um, this one, I believe it's 6.38, so let me do 6.38, and then times 10 to the minus 12. So I get 9.8, yeah. So this is 6.38 approximately, 6.38. So I get 9.799, so about 9.8 meters per second, uh, 9.8 meters per second. Meters per second squared. Okay. So now, for um, I want to just show you for circular orbits why the square of the orbital's period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. So if you have a, if it's a circle, there is no semi-major, semi-minor. Both are r, just the radius r. 
semi-major, semi-minor, are equal to each other. And so if you have uh, here, you have a, here is a, a little planet, here is another planet, and this one is orbiting with, uh, with some speed here. This is radius R, this is capital M, this is little m, and it's going around. So the speed of this planet will be uh, the distance traveled over the period. So it's 2 pi r divided by the period. So v will be 2 pi r divided by the, by the period. And we would like to, uh, uh, now what is the force on this planet? F would equal to uh, the mass times the acceleration. The left side is capital G, capital M, little m, divided by the separation squared. The right-hand side will be the mass, and if it's a circular orbit, it would be v squared over r for the acceleration. So you get v squared over r. But v is 2 pi r divided by capital P and u squared. The little mass goes away, and here I have, uh, um, let's see, capital G, capital M, divided by r squared equals 2. Oh, I'm sorry, it should be v squared over r. So it should be an r here, v squared over r, yeah. Um, and so let's see what we get. We get 4 pi squared, 4 pi squared, and then r squared divided by p squared, and then times 1 over r. Uh, 1 over r cancels there. And so let's just multiply both sides by p and both sides by r squared. When you multiply this side by r squared, the r goes away. Uh, the r squared goes away, and you just and you multiply by the t squared, so you get g capital M t squared. How about the, the other side? It's 4 pi squared r, but we're multiplying by r squared, so it becomes r cubed. So 4 pi squared r cubed. And we multiply it by the t squared, so the t goes away. And we'll divide both sides by the gm. So divide both sides by gm, so gm goes away, and notice what we get. We get the period squared is proportional to the cube of the radius. The square of a planet's orbital period is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis. So this is t squared is proportional. This is just a constant. This could be the mass of the sun. This is a gravitational constant. And 4 pi r squared is, of course, a constant. So t squared is proportional to, uh, to, r, uh, to r cubed. Again, uh, the uh, Kepler's laws are a summary of lots of data collection. Newton nailed it and came up with the exact force law and, uh, and says, uh, basically, it is uh, the force between two masses, any two masses, is uh, given by g m1 m2 over r squared and it says it applies for point masses as well as it applies for larger masses it applies today and it applies tomorrow and in the future it also uh, applies right here and it applies over there and basically everywhere um, so that's how uh, uh, how you would apply it because otherwise the laws would be kind of i mean i wouldn't say useless but if they were only applicable on Earth and then they don't apply everywhere else, uh, then you have to come up with laws that apply everywhere. And we're confident that, or at least we assume, that they apply everywhere and the data supports that. So in the next part, I want to show you uh, Kepler's second law, this one. <laughs> equal areas in equal times. So let me just try to convince you of that and show you how it's a consequence of uh, uh, Newton's law of gravitation. And also conservation of angular momentum. Uh, let me get my thing here. Okay. So here is an ellipse. Here is, uh, here is the sun, and here is the ellipse. So this is the focus here. So let's say I have a, my planet is here, and then later on it's here. So this is R at this position, R at prime T, 
a little bit later, the planets would be here, so that's R at T plus delta T. R at T plus delta T. So this is delta R. Delta R. That's the change in position. Because R plus delta R will give me R later. That's because R later minus R now, that's the change. So R plus R now plus R, delta R will give me R later. Okay. And um, I want to remind you, for a circle, what is the area, or for, for in general like this, what is this, what is this area? It's a triangle. I remember for a triangle, um, for a triangle, here is a triangle. What is the area of, a, of this triangle here? Well, it's half the base, half the base. Uh, let, me, let me see here. Oh, right. it's the area of a triangle is half the base times the height. Let's say this length here is A, and this length here is B, so the height is this. This is the height. And let's call this angle here theta. The height would just be uh, this length B times the sine of theta. So that's the length B times the sine of theta. And let me, if this is a vector pointing this way, then this is the, the magnitude of, of that vector, and this is the magnitude of B times the sine of theta. And uh, this is the magnitude of the vector A. And so the area would be half the base, which is A, times uh, the height, which is B sine theta. So let's see here. So th this little area here, uh, so yeah, let me say the area would be one half of the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle theta. But this should remind you of the magnitude of the cross product. Oh my God, uh, <laughs> I should have... Area, I will write area. Because I, <laughs> uh, area. I use the same, same symbol, area. So area starts with an A and I chose here vectors A and B. So anyway, so the area is one half A, B, and sine theta. And the magnitude of A, the magnitude of B times the sine of the angle should remind you of the cross product, the magnitude of the cross product. So the area, would be one half of the cross product of the, mag uh, the magnitude of the cross product of A and B. All right, so now I have a triangle here. Here's R, here is delta R, and uh, so this is the triangle that I'm looking at. So what's the area of this triangle? It would be half the base, let me call it delta A, the amount of area there, delta area. It's one half of the base, one half of the base, and so times, uh, times the height. So it would be one half of the base times the height, which is R, and the height would be uh, delta R. And I'm going to use the cross product, so it would be one half the base, uh, which is R cross delta R. Cross delta R. So it would be one half of R cross delta, delta R, like so. This would be the magnitude of that. And so delta A, would equal to one half of R cross what? But what is uh, what is delta R? Delta R is the velocity with which you're moving, or the speed with which the magnitude of delta R would be the velocity uh, or the speed times delta t. So delta R would be uh, the velocity times delta t. Times delta t. So I'm going to write here the velocity times delta t. Of course, delta t is a constant. It doesn't enter into the cross product. So I'm going to pull it out. So delta a will equal to one half of r cross v and then the delta t. Divide both sides by delta t, the area per unit of time would be one half of r cross v. r cross v. So this is... Um, 
a line drawn between the sun and the planet sweeps equal areas during equal intervals of time. Here's the sun, here's the planet, and the planet is moving. And so delta A per unit of time will be this. By the way, in the limit as this goes to zero, that would be exactly delta A, uh, dA. So this is delta A over delta T. Uh, in the limit, as, delta, uh, as uh, T goes to zero, this becomes like this. dA dT is equal to one half of R cross V. And this is constant. We want this to be constant. All right? That's what Kepler's law says. It says this is constant. So if this is constant, then this is constant. Now, is this constant? Is this constant? And the answer is yes, it is constant. Or what does the implication that this is constant imply? Well, uh, if this is constant, then uh, half of it, if, if half of it is constant, then R cross V is constant. So that means. I put here if and only if, but it's equivalent. It's equivalent to saying that R cross V is constant. Now, what is R cross V? What physical quantity should it, does it remind you of? Let me let me remind you of this. Uh, let me multiply by the mass. If I multiply by by the mass on the left side and multiply this constant by the by the mass, it will stay a constant by the mass of the, of the planet that's moving. So I will have this, R cross, I'll multiply by the mass, so mv equals to, multiplying a constant by a constant gives me another constant, so it's still a constant. Now what is the mass m, mv, uh, uh, mass times velocity, that's the momentum, so this is R cross p, the momentum, it's constant. Okay, what is R cross P? So this is equivalent to saying this, and that's equivalent to saying this. So the area being constant implies this is to be constant. And if this is constant, it implies, if half of this is constant, it implies the whole quantity is constant. And multiplying it by a constant gives you another constant, so that implies R cross MV is also constant. And if R cross MV is constant, it, uh, that is R cross the momentum. And by definition, R cross the momentum, the cross product of the position vector and the momentum vector is the angular momentum vector. So this is equivalent to saying that the angular momentum, the magnitude of the angular momentum is constant. Okay, is constant. In, in fact, it will imply even more than that. Uh, so that if the magnitude of the angular momentum is constant, what does it mean? When is angular momentum constant? It means it's conserved. It doesn't change over time. It means the net torque is equal to zero. So let me say more than that. It's not just constant in magnitude. It's also constant in direction. Why? What does that mean? Well, if it's an ellipse like this, it means later on it's not going to be a rotated ellipse. It's not, the planet is not going like that and, and just changing the position. So it says, if the cross, remember the cross product produces a vector that's perpendicular to the, both vectors. So the angular momentum vector is pointing like that. Um, let me see, R cross, yeah, it's pointing out. It means it will always be perpendicular to the plane of this board. It means the angular uh, momentum is constant. So this is saying that the angular momentum is the constant vector. Well, if the angular momentum is constant, it means its own derivative is equal to zero, right? The derivative of a constant is zero. And this zero here, it's uh, taken derivative of a vector, so it's the zero vector. And then, uh, let's see, what's the derivative of the angular momentum? Remember, we took the derivative of the angular momentum uh, in the last chapter, it was the derivative of R cross P plus R times the derivative of P, uh, uh, the cross product of R with the derivative of P. And the first part was zero because derivative of R is V and uh, the velocity cross momentum. Momentum is basically mass times velocity. Uh, that would give us zero. So that, uh, that turned out that uh, R uh, cross the force 
is equal to constant. Actually, let me let me do it. It doesn't hurt to, to review that. Uh, let me see how much time I have in. Yeah. Um, so it, it, yeah, let me just yeah, let me just say that it implies that the torque is equal to zero. If the angular momentum is constant, the torque is equal to zero. The torque is equal to R cross F. That has to be zero. Well, let's see. R is not zero. F is not zero because there is a force. How come they are zero? If this is zero, if this is not zero and this is not zero, it means these two are parallel to each other or the angle between them is zero. And it means the position vector is parallel to the force to the force vector, which makes sense because the here is the sun, here is the planet, the position vector is in this direction and the force is in this direction. So they happen to be anti-parallel to uh, anti anti-parallel. So that's why the angle is between them is 180, which is, which makes sense because Newton's law Newton's law of gravitation says the force acts along the line that's connecting them, and so that's uh, what it says. All right, I ran out of time on this video. Let me skip, uh, go to the next one. See you in a moment.